Hello and welcome to Sound and Vision. Again, as always, I am your host Ian James and again, as always, I am joined by the brilliant and beautiful and luscious Miss Hope Wade. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> luscious. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd just try and throw you by adding something different. Um, <laughs> I might do that. I, might I like make, it. I'm going to make that a thing from now on okay i think i'm just gonna add something every time just to catch you off guard <laughs> i'd like to see you try it yeah well okay <laughs> that, that, that was that's today's one um so today is for anyone who's keeping score this is episode 17 the lost boys oh yeah love it okay well that was gonna be my next question how do, how do you feel about the lost boys it's a good it's a good 80s flick cheesy fun yeah. vampire great one-liners yeah yeah it's, and, it, and it just remains a real popular favorite mm. i'm sure but this what we're doing today is it, there's probably a hundred lost boys podcasts out there somewhere yeah um but, but, but our, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> but they don't sound like ours no, of course um, absolutely not um, um <laughs> obviously we're in doing? sync yeah a little, little bit too in sync it's frightening um <laughs> Stop it. It's, Get out of my head. Good... <laughs> I often tell her that I am in her head running around. Naked. Naked. <laughs> Not to disturb you guys. Listening. I know. No visuals, no, please. No. You really don't want to see that. Um, well, I do. But get off my man. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so... <laughs> Just before everyone switches off, makes this is shit. I was I was promised a good podcast, and you just give me this fucking nonsense between the two of you. Um, oh, I've heard worse. Trust me. Yes, much, much, <laughs> much. Sorry. So this good and bad. N- yeah, this is the awesome podcast. Um, you ready, bro? I'm ready, bro. I'm down on it. If it is a good day when we're doing a podcast. Um, so yeah, this is. Um, the Lost Boys, the 1987 <laughs> American comedy from the 80s that, as Hope said, is... Cheesy fun. Cheesy fun. Quotable, memorable, mm. everyone loves it. It just seems to keep going. I think this the cult for this movie really it's generation, keeps going. Yeah, every generation loves this movie. I yeah. think it's just because it has the perfect combo of humor, uh, the scary vampires, Yeah, you know, um, good story. And it's just, it works well, you know? Yeah. I think so. Good yeah. actors, yeah, which you don't find much anymore. <laughs> no, I think I think yeah, no, you've got a point there. I think when I get to it, Joel Schumacher, who directed this movie, said for him personally, it was the best cast he ever worked with. Really, which is a compliment when, when I consider the films at a point eight. I don't rate Schumacher as a filmmaker, but he had some mm. Hallison cast. Good um, people, yeah, yeah. And, and that was something that he said. Um, is you, this where the two Corys come together? It too? is. This is yeah. yes, absolutely. The first which film. I will we, we will cover later okay. in the show. But yeah, it is the one. Um, do you remember how old you were when you first saw this? Mm. No, I was young. Just probably y- yeah, yeah, ten okay. maybe somewhere around there. I, yeah, I could tell a story that would really embarrass my cousin, but I know he maybe might be... Maybe a little bit old. I would be a little bit older. What year did this come out? 87. 87? Yeah, so yeah. I probably saw it. I was like 12, 13. Okay. No, I was going to say that I could tell a story that would really embarrass my cousin, but I know he listens to this, so I won't do the story. <laughs> oh, no, you he, can't he would do never... that. <laughs> you cannot do that. Because he would never forgive me. We won't name names. We don't no. know which cousin. You have a few cousins. I do. Um, we but... won't name names. I kind of know, probably, but I won't yeah. name it. No, when this film came out... Um... I won't shame name. I won't shame name you. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Well, basically, when this film came out, um, I had an uncle, Philip. Um <laughs> <laughs> He used to come right. He was, he was the kind of he was a slightly younger uncle then. He was a little bit, you know, the youngest of my dad's brothers, and mm. he and he would watch all these kind of movies that were cult and cool, and he, you know, because he was the younger brother. And I always remember coming around and saying to my dad, "Oh, we've seen this movie the other day. It's called The Lost Boys." And this was around about I don't know, I must have been nine, probably about nine or ten. Mm-hmm. And he would keep coming around going on about The Lost Boys. So he pricked my interest in this for the first time. I was like, "Oh, this film called The Lost Boys." So that's how I become. Which more to the point, that's how I became aware of The Lost Boys. Mm-hmm. Um. And then it, I remember it showing on TV, and this is the story, that my cousin wanted to watch this movie, and his mum and dad, I'm not going to name names, but they were like, you, know, you shouldn't really watch this movie, it's too much for you. And no, no, that'd be cool, it's always, you know, it's like Corey Falman, it's all these young kids, and it'd be really cool. And he watched it, and they watched it with him for about 45 minutes, and went to bed, and thought, ah, he's okay watching this. And then, of course, they change, don't they? Yeah. You know, when they, they there's the big sequence where they suddenly reveal themselves. As well. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, the, <laughs> the next thing they know, my auntie woke up and he was, he was sort of sleeping at the bottom of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but Scaredy cat. Again, I'll mention her names. We've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so going right back to the beginning then, um, to break this movie down from the beginning. It, f- Finally enough, it, it, weirdly, this, start, this story starts with The Goonies. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, The Goonies was a uh, 1985 movie by Richard Donner, once mm-hmm. again made by Warner Brothers, which was produced and I think co-written by Steven Spielberg, which was like an adventure movie for kids. And as I said, it came out in 85, did really well, made a lot of money. So Warner Brothers wanted a follow-up to that. Let's do something like Goonies again. Let's do something really cool like Goonies. Um, so they, they kind of put that idea to uh, Janice Fisher and James Jeremiah, who, re- who wrote the original treatment for a movie to be known as The Lost Boys. So that was the idea they were given. They came up with the name The Lost Boys and wanted to do this kind of postmodern riff on Peter Pan. Mm-hmm. Which is the interesting thing here. The Lost Boys gets its title from The Lost Boys in Peter Pan. And I'm not sure how familiar, how familiar are you with Peter Pan, by the way. I know it, but I don't like it. I'm, uh, not, a, I'm not a Peter Pan fan. Okay. <laughs> but, but for anyone who is, this, this will be of interest. I know there. some of it, though. I know okay. You know the basics, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Okay, so that was this, this, the treatment given to these two people who came up with the idea call this movie The Lost Boys. And the original story that they came up with as their follow-up for The Goonies, again directed by Warner Brothers, um, made by Warner Brothers, again to be directed by Richard Donner, who directed The Goonies, and also directed The Omen and Superman and then various other movies. And so the original the original pitch for the story, um, the original story then, was that, <sighs> you'll love this, basically, yes, this family do come to Santa Carla, which is where the film's all based, and it's going to be based on this brother um, called David. But originally, in the original idea, is his name was Peter. Okay, as like, a, oh, there's a touch to Peter Pan. Now, he was going to play the Wendy role, okay? okay? And he would make friends with all these younger people that would kind of form the Lost Boys in this small town. And Star was going to be the Peter Pan character, the one who kind of drew him into this mm-hmm. this kind of adventure and world. So so Star was a boy, originally, in the okay. original screenplay. It was a boy, and she was the Peter Pan part. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the dog was once again in the story and of course Nanny is the dog from Peter Pan so that's why the dog's mm. called Nanook. Nanook. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, that was basically the story and the, and the Frog Brothers were, were also in this but they were going to be uh, little chubby camp scout eight-year-olds. It was all going to be like a real little kiddie Brady Bunch little kiddie Goonies type movie where the principal characters would all be 13, 14 like they are in the Goonies mm-hmm. and they would make friends with the eight-year-old Frog Brothers who would help them out and Star was a, a little boy you know built basically based on Peter Pan and that was the story and you know, Richard Donner you know quite like this idea wanted to make it they put up an 8.5 million budget for it so a decent decent budget to make this big follow up to the Goonies now as, as it went on as, as the film was being developed and written it started to take longer to write and the set up of the post uh, pre-production stuff was just taking ages to the point where Richard Donner walked off the project just saying it's taking too long I've got a chance to go and do this movie called Lethal Weapon I want to go and do this is taking too long now so he, he, he left the project to do Lethal Weapon and then they brought in Mary Lambert to direct it and they, she, at this point this was a female director in the 80s who was making music videos and she would eventually go on to direct Pet Cemetery and they had a sequel and then she left the project for creative differences and finally the, the film fell to Joel Schumacher who was an up-and-coming director at this point. He'd worked in Hollywood through the 70s, um, wrote the screenplays for um, Car Wash, the, the 70s company, The Wiz, the the uh, Motown, Wizard of Oz, mm. Rejig, Sparkle, which was the, almost like the original Dream Girls. I've seen all these movies as well. Like, George Schumacher had a hand in writing all these. And a bit of the industry a long time, I think he was he worked on Woody Allen's uh, Sleeper as well. But by, but the important point is here, he just made St. Almost Fire, which was only his second movie as a director. And because of St. Elmo's Fire, he was brought in to make this movie. Now, he came to it, like the budget, like he had like a bit of room to manoeuvre around. But the first thing that he said once he got on this movie was like, this needs to be rewritten. Yeah. Okay. Because was, there, was, there was still a vampire angle to it, but it was like a kiddie vampire movie yeah. with little kids. Mm-hmm. And he said, why, why don't we make the vampires and the kids a bit older? Yeah. So older teenagers. Mm-hmm. And then Because he said this, the, basically, I think Joel Schumacher famously said, this film needs sex. Mm-hmm. It needs like jazzing up. It needs sex, and yeah. you know, bring, bring, bring this. You know, oh, bring. they got jazzing up, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, Joel Schumacher was the man for that. I mean, eventually, he would go on to do the awful Batman sequels, where it got camp. Yeah, you know, where 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 George Clooney was walking around oh, with a nipple nipples. suit. Yeah, mm. and, like, yeah, so Joel Schu- and Joel Schumacher Bad. loved those films. No, Schumacher loves them. He said that's exactly what I wanted. Ugh. I wanted to make camp Batman. Oh, it's um, terrible. Which, which he did. <laughs> One of the worst. Um, I completely agree. But for Schumacher, it was like, yep, that's what I wanted. Anyway, so he comes in off St. Anne's Fire to make this movie, and the first thing he does is brings in a friend of his from the industry called Jeffrey Bowen who wrote The Dead Zone and um, the Cronenberg adaption of adaptation I should say of um, Stephen, Stephen King's King. book thank mm-hmm. you now Jeffrey Bowen come in and the first thing he did is rejig genders for the movie so the David character um, 
yeah, now going to have this brother who's going to be a little bit prominent. He kind of changed the name to Star. Finally, became Star as we know as we know her in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also introduced the granddad character. Um, the, the, this old boy who kind of knew the town and knew the mysteries of the town uh, so it, oh. it was him that introduced that part of the movie and, and so in so many ways Jeffrey Bohm kind of made this film become the movie that we know it to be now and between yeah. him and Joel Schumacher they're the ones that made The Lost Boys as we know The Lost Boys thank god they took that little Peter Pan crap out of it I know but it did it, <laughs> yeah to a degree because I don't do we need another Goonies? I don't mm. probably not um, originally though I've got to say here just because before we goes into casting now with this movie because the film is set up now it's two little brothers that move with their mother to Santa Carla to start this new life and while they're in this little town they start realising there's an underbelly of vampires or teenage vampires should we say and they all suddenly get drawn into this world um, and that basically is the Lost Boys in a nutshell but the Grandad character when he was added to the screenplay was originally written and to be given uh, to John Carradine who I absolutely love is like mm-hmm. a horror icon from the 1940s right through mm-hmm. um, fantastic um, but he was too ill to do the part um, which is really sad because I'd like to have seen him do it um, yeah. but I could see where he would have been too ill because I've seen him in certain films in the early 80s and he already looks quite fragile so Bernard Hughes was was, was Sal um, character actor from the 1970s was brought in as the granddad but just going uh, back so Schumacher directed now uh, Jeffrey Bones reworked the original screenplay Thomas Newman's brought in to do the score was always reliable um, director of photography which I really want to point out here because that's always important to me is Michael Chapman who's again one of the great DPs in cinema tremendous work on Scorsese's uh, movies um, Taxi Driver Raging Bull also shot The Wanderers hardcore for Paul Schrader Fingers also did Michael Jackson Bad Video which again was directed by uh, Scorsese so really good DP and, and does such a good job on this movie for the look of it I think he does a really good job you know just for those flying scenes alone that point of view flying scene which mm. was his idea that we could shoot instead of shooting bloody one of these characters fly which would almost be impossible pre-CGI mm. we'll shoot a point of view so the camera can be the vampire like looming in the sky and stuff which I kind of like those touches I think that's one of the cleverest bits of this movie so mm. fair play to Michael Chapman for coming up with that idea because I think it really works here so yeah with the crew in place then it was no down to casting for this movie okay starting off with the Michael character um, which is Jason Patrick yes mm-hmm. absolutely is, is the eldest um, the eldest brother, brother. yes mm-hmm. um, and like I said yeah, Jason Patrick at this point I, I don't think he did anything in particular to get the part I think he'd just seen pictures of him mm-hmm. and you know he's a good looking you know part good looking hit. lad yeah absolutely <laughs> which showed that Schumacher I mean had a real knack for finding faces and, it, and of course he did Sam was fire so he was always like oh, tired yeah, with that whole brat pat thing mm-hmm. yeah and he kind of understood who, who looked good who, looked, who, who looked was good. photogenic yeah. and uh, stuff who so. was going to be popular at the time uh, absolutely who are we going to make popular now yeah that yeah. kind of thing so mm-hmm. yeah Jason Patrick puts in this movie who's as I mentioned on another podcast previous Jason Miller's son mm. from um, The Exorcist and also is Joshua Miller's half brother mm. and Joshua Miller was off making Near Dark at the same year so it's quite funny that the two brothers ended up in two, vampire two pivotal vampire movies yeah, yeah. Um, so Jason Patrick is cast as, as the eldest brother Michael now for the star role they obviously wanted something quite striking you know mm-hmm. who was going to take his attention and become you know the kind of what starts this whole movie off to a degree you know the brother's involvement in the whole mystery and Schumacher envisioned uh, a blonde and really wanted Meg Ryan which mm-hmm. would be interesting okay no um, which is yeah, it's just kind of interesting because I think well, what he had seen to want Meg Ryan anyway Apparently, Jason Patrick changed his mind yeah. and said, I know this actress, and we've just made this movie called Solar Babies. Yeah. Uh, do you remember that oh, one? Yeah, I remember yeah. we watched that recently. And that's how she got the part, though. Oh, okay. He showed Solar Babies to Joel Schumacher, and Joel Schumacher was, oh, yeah, yeah, she looks good. <laughs> she, yeah, she yeah looks it, good. it would have We're to be friends. she looks good because the acting in that movie wasn't that great. <laughs> well, it's not even a good movie, is it? No, but the no. fact is that they, and the chemistry was already there because they yeah. had boyfriend and girlfriend in that. So yeah, Schumacher it's a fun like, movie. Yeah. And I liked her when she did, what's that one movie? Crossroads? No. The Less City. than zero. No. Well, yes, I know less than zero. <laughs> was that before? That was definitely before the, uh, Lost Boys, right? Less than zero. No, it's after. After? Okay, yeah. but no. The one the one with the colors that I'm always talking about that I love. The city. City. The guy with the <laughs> police academies in it. I always say this. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Alphabet City. <laughs> Alphabet City. Sorry, Hope. I'm, yeah, yeah. That I was one say, of, what film was she on about? That was one of her first movies, yes, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. See? Because she's in 16 Candles as well, isn't she? Little bits here and there. Oh, the yes. Beginning. But yeah, Alphabet City. Oh, yeah, City. she played the friend. Yeah. <laughs> so Alpha- cut off the hair. Yeah. But Alphabet City, right at the beginning, mm-hmm. which is a great movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the most Excellent. underappreciated movies of the decade, yes. I think. Yes. 
Yeah, the guy from Police Academy. Yeah, the guy who makes the noises. <laughs> Michael Winslow. Um, I always say that. To ever like reference that movie if I forget, because I I fucking forget it every single I know time. You do. I'm like it just it was beautifully shot with colors. Incredibly shot, well shot, yeah. And uh, it has the guy from Police Academy. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. He's forever the guy from Police Academy. <laughs> I actually met him in real life. I'm gutted now. I didn't go up to him and say my girlfriend knows you. Is is the guy who does the noises? From Police Academy. <laughs> you don't have a name. Um, but yeah, so yes, she is in that, and Jamie yeah. Gertz is here as Star. Wait a minute. Okay. Yes. Didn't she do TV too? Or am I thinking of somebody else? Maybe. Uh, no, no, no. She probably did do some TV. Because I'm thinking even... of Square Pegs, but I could be thinking okay. of somebody else. No, my knowledge of TV is appalling. She could have so, been, it could have been yeah. somebody else in there. That I'm know, thinking I... that looks like her, kind of, and I could be wrong. But yeah, she may have done TV. But I could see how they got her instead of uh, Meg Ryan. Yeah. Which yeah. is good, I would... But think. it works out for the movie overall, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Off um, track. We'll get back on track here. No, 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 no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, um, those two in place then. Uh, Bernard Hughes comes in on the movie as the granddad. Edward Herman, um, who was wonderful the year before for Woody Allen's uh, Purple Rose of Cairo, which is amazing. But he comes in as Max, the head vampire in this one, does a good job. Mm-hmm. Most importantly at this point, it would be Diane Weist, who also won the Oscar the year before for Woody Allen's Hannah and her sisters. Oh, okay. And I think Joel Schumacher was quite taken back that she wanted to do it. He's yeah. like, wow, you want to be in my movie? You just want, you know, an Oscar for this highbrow movie and you want to go and do this little vampire movie. Yeah. But she did, and she's very good here too. Yeah, I love her. Uh, she was in Parenthood too, wasn't yeah. she? Fantastic, yeah. yeah love that and Weast. So, you know, like I said, like you even said, it was the best cast he ever worked with. I and mean, this is a guy who, like I said, made St. Elmo's Fire, but he also made uh, Falling Down and The Time to Kill, 8mm, Flatliners, Batman. Um, first of all, I'm not saying any of these movies are great, but they have big casts, and that's the point I'm making. For well, him, had, so he did Flatliners, who also had Kiefer and Jason in it. Weren't not Jason, Flatliners? but Kiefer. Jason Patrick wasn't in that one? No. I thought he was. Okay. No. I'm thinking of somebody else. You're probably thinking of the guy who did noises from Police Academy. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, whatever. <laughs> I don't like that movie that much anymore. Okay, felt like this. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Like I said, this, he said it's the best casting work with. And we got to mention to the, to the vampire core of things now. Actually, well, no, actually, we'll just stop on little Corey A, which we should mention. Um, and you mentioned earlier on this was the film that you met Corey Farmer on. You're mm-hmm. absolutely right. Um, the little connection before this, though, is they both auditioned for Mouth in the Goonies mm-hmm. and they'd only met each other once before and it's when they both went for the same role mm-hmm. which of course Corey Farman won the part yeah and then um, so yeah so, so Corey Aim kind of knew who he was and he knew he was getting a bit of hype around this time he's like who's this ever Corey that beat me to the Goonies and he's doing quite well because he just done Stand By Me with Kiefer Sutherland as well, mm-hmm. which is another little connection to this one. Corey uh, Haim? No, Corey Feldman. Feldman. Yeah. And, but yeah, Corey Haim went and did Lucas, didn't he? Yes, he did, yeah, yeah. which is a, a great piece of work. Probably his best performance, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, easily. So yeah, so so Corey Haim came to this movie, met Corey Feldman on set, and was like, we were the other Corey everyone's talking about, and they, they hit it off instantly, apparently. Mm-hmm. That was like natural chemistry between the two of them. They just become fast friends. I love them. Um, to the point where they were partying a lot, though, on Too set, much. which kind of pissed off Joel Schumacher, who mm-hmm. was trying to get his movie made. Um, and they hung out a bit. Yeah, went to party and, and, and social events together. But yeah, that was the start of the friendship right there. Mm. Um, obviously, Corey Farmer comes into this movie then, like you said, off Goonies, because he was the only connection to the Goonies thing where they were trying to do a follow-up to Goonies. Corey Farmer kind of carried over then. That could be a whole show together as the two Corys. Yeah. Who's your favourite? Oh, Feldman. Oh. Just because the, the, the movies. It, it's not more movies that interest me. Oh, I like Corey Haim. Yeah, I think Haim was a better actor, though. Yeah. If I can't oh, be, definitely. Be really honest. Um, okay, so <laughs> so yeah, the, the two Corys. Uh, to the vampire side of things, then. Um, Kiefer Sutherland is cast as the head vampire. Um, apparently, because Joel Schumacher had seen a very minor role of his in At Close Range, which is a great 80s, you know, Sean Penn movie. And it makes me laugh when I hear that, because... I don't think Kiefer, I think Kiefer Sutherland may have one line of dialogue in that whole movie, but there's a close up of him at the end when they're in in the prison cell, and it kind of the camera pans past Kiefer Sutherland, and it, apparently it was that one shot the Joel Schumacher scene. It was like, I want him. Mm. He just looks exactly what I have in mind for this role. And interestingly enough, as well, that apparently Kiefer Sutherland has the least lines of dialogue in that movie. Uh, the major characters, really? Yeah, he is the poster boy for it. He's mm-hmm. pretty much what anyone ever thinks of when you talk about this movie. And the one liners come from him. Yeah. I think a well, lot. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, the the least amount of script on this movie, and he he only properly said yes to doing this movie 
because it was a chance to meet in excess, apparently. Oh, really? Yeah, apparently. Uh, he said to George, if you can get me in to meet in excess, I'll do the movie. Because <laughs> apparently he spent a little bit of time in Australia with his dad, Donald, and, uh-huh. and he got to like him as a band. So he was very excited that they were going to work on this movie. Oh, okay. Um, which Joel Schumacher repaid the favour to in excess, who did the song with Jimmy Barnes for this one's a good times, I think, mm-hmm. um, by shooting the Devil Inside music video for him the following year. So mm-hmm. Joel Schumacher shot on the music video in return for them. To me. Taking part in this one, yeah. Oh, so so just anything. on the favour side of things. But apparently Kiefer Sutherland only did the movie because in excess were in. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, he wants to be a musician. Hence the reason he has a band now, right? He does, yeah. He plays, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. Yes, he does. I haven't heard any of it. Um, me either. I think we discussed this before in one we of are, our podcasts. We are. just about to say that. <laughs> Him, Kevin Bacon. I'm sorry. I haven't listened to any of your music. No. And but I, I pro- like your movies. Yeah. And I, I probably won't listen to any of it. Um... <laughs> Okay, other people that did audition for this, just for a bit of fun here. Jim Carrey was considered for the David <laughs> role. Jim, he just did once bitten. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, I want to do this. So really? David, the head vampire, could have been Jim Carrey. Oh, no, that would have been all wrong. Well, it could have been Ben Stiller, too, because he auditioned as oh, well. Oh, God. Yeah. It's, he, he's, yeah. He's weird with me. I, I'm hit and miss with Ben Stiller sometimes. Would you, would you want to see Jim Carrey and Ben Stiller as vampires? No. Okay. They're comedians. Comedy First vampires. Off. Yeah. Well. Okay. Which makes me think of that show. What was it? What we do in the shadows? Mm, which I don't like. Yeah, no. don't like that one. No, but they even reference the worms scene from this in that in their of show. Of course apparently. they do. Of course they do because they're so cool. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> they're copycats. Yeah. Yeah. I what, get it. What we do in the shit. Um, <laughs> it's a shit movie. <laughs> okay. So, that's pretty much the casting taken care of. Now, the movie was shot in the course of three weeks. Oh, really? To complete shooting. So, very I, quick. Very quick. Yeah, very me. kind of to story. make this, this gem of a movie that's a classic today and yeah. everybody still loves and only took three weeks. It just goes to show. You can make anything. Yeah. Three weeks. Yeah. Anything, What's the budget on it? Anything can be accomplished quickly. Yeah, if you have money. <laughs> um, yeah. I just wonder where Hope's mind was going there. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I was thinking. It's I know like, you well, it's quickly. If we... <laughs> yeah. I'll just let you have five minutes to recover from that. Um, <laughs> you okay there? No. What? <laughs> you okay there? Um, <laughs> right, back, back in the room. Back in the room. Um, <laughs> Mutley's coming out. I know, I could do the Mutley. <laughs> that's no nook. That's no nook. Um, oh, God. Love it. Yeah. So, three weeks to shoot this movie, pieced it together, it was released on its 8.5 budget in 1987, it returned 32.2 million pounds, that's how successful this movie was. Made a lot of money. Yeah. Um, enough, enough, interestingly enough, for them to consider the sequel, which Joel Schumacher did want to make, and he originally wrote the idea as the Lost Girls, but see, this is the thing, <laughs> hang on me here, hang on me here. Now, this Lost Girls thing has come up in recent times, and everyone started moaning, going, oh, the Lost Girls, oh, it's just that whole gender thing from today. Why haven't they made that yet? Because this the, generation, uh, I don't know. They're probably. <laughs> I think it is going into. Um, I think they're making a TV series out of it oh, now. Fuck. But Joel Schumacher played with the idea of making this into a, in, in, as part to be a sequel, and it would feature um, the Kiefer Sutherland character David um, from this movie. Because apparently, if you, if you take a look at the end of the movie, when all the vampires die, mm. and no two vampires die the same, as Corey Feldman says, um, <laughs> it was really poor. I'm, I'm full of Corey Feldman impressions. I'll get a few more. Um, <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> I bet you can. You loved it, didn't you? you? It's wonderful. You should see the smile on her face. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, basically, he's the only character that we don't see kind of bubble up or die or anything. He kind of gets impaled on the deer antler. Sorry if anyone hasn't seen this movie, I'm sure you have. He gets impaled on the deer antler, doesn't he? I don't feel sorry. People need to watch it before they even listen to us. But yes, he gets impaled on the deer antlers. But but if you haven't seen it and you're just curious about it, please still listen. Um, <laughs> um yeah, so he, he dies on the deer antlers, but... but he doesn't, you don't see him die any more than that. And the whole thing is, right, the whole thing is is that they were going to use his character to come back so he would play a part in starting off the sequel. That's why you don't see him die a certain way and you're always kind of really 100% sure if he dies. Like, and like the rest of them, you get obliterated, basically. The uh, vampires, I mean. Yeah. Death by Stereo is my favourite. And, yeah, and all that business. So, in, in ter- yeah, in terms of the story then, like I said, two brothers come to this town, live with the granddad, and then mum um, um, gets a job yeah, at working... Because the mum just recently got divorced, That's right? right, yeah. yeah. And she meets up with the Max character. Yeah. Who runs... What's he school? Run? Was it a no, school or something? No, he's got like, um, like a... A vid- shop? A shop, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's it is a video shop. It's a video shop, shop isn't it? Yeah. And, and if you look in the background, there's 
placed videos in the background because there's a lot of in jokes in this which a lot a lot of people don't know about Joel Schumacher tried to squeeze in as many little things as he could here mm. um, and I think there's a, a stand by me or something video in the background of one scene and in the bedroom of Corey Haim there's a Rob Lowe poster prominent on his wardrobe yes. which, which is a nod to St. Anne's Fire because oh, nice. he was in contact with Rob Lowe and he said oh okay. and apparently he made a joke to Rob Lowe saying I'll put you in my next film and that was his way of, <laughs> as doing, that was his way of doing it that's hilarious um, and apparently yeah so if you look at the videos in the background there's little nods to some of, the, some of these actors that are in other things uh, Max takes up with the man and of course uh, the Corey Haim character is, is, is kind of met what is now known as the Frog Brothers mm-hmm. which is, uh, which originally like I said were based as eight year old campy little kids mm. and it now Obviously, they're the teenage brothers. They worked in a comic store. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that is their kind of knowledge. I say pop culture, all this movie is their knowledge of vampires and vampire yeah. lore is taken from comic books. Yeah. Um, played, it. as we mentioned, by Corey Feldman. And uh, Jameson Newlander, who plays the other brother. No, mm-hmm. Edgar Allen. Obviously, Edgar Allen Poe is where mm-hmm. the character names come from. Yeah. So, th- these two bumbling brothers that make up the midsection of the, the, the second act of the movie when the characters kind of know what they're doing, where they're going. Now, these are kind of added like a bit of comic relief by, you know, Corey Feldman and, and stuff. And, of course, those characters have become iconic enough now to become regularly worn Halloween costumes. Apparently, a lot of, apparently in recent years, the, the Frog Brother costumes have, have become a thing. App- oh yeah apparently camouflage yeah bandanas. yeah and apparently <laughs> yeah james and newlander he didn't really do a lot after this would be really honest though he was in the remake of the blob and he did appear in uh, bone tomahawk in recent years where, oh, okay. where he played the mayor which interested me because i was like well i haven't seen him for years but yeah he's got a minor part in that um i think he was like 20 or i think he was 20 or 21 when he made this movie Mm, and really? uh, yeah a bit of trivia for you is the, the, the scene at the end where he gets grabbed because he's only meant to be like 14 15 in there yeah or 14 i think 13 14 mm-hmm. and the scene where he gets grabbed um where the, the, the vampire gets put in the bath and i forget now but he, the scene where he grabs him by the chest apparently he grabbed like a handful of his chest hairs and he said the pain on my face is, re- <laughs> is real <laughs> um obviously he was a bit more older than the other cast members oh yeah Corey Falman though apparently got s- was fired i can't mention this and rehired within about three days um he turned up wasted yeah from cocaine um and joel schumacher took him to they instantly sacked him because he yeah. was fluffing his lines and everything and joel schumacher said like you know if you can come back in two days uh, you know but basically joel schumacher saved him in that movie mm-hmm. by saying that you know if i'll give you two days to sort of say if you don't you know whatever but he did rehire him yeah um, but it's kind of sad to think that i remember watching a documentary r- recently of Corey feldman talking about yeah. it and him saying that you know he did stupid stupid things when he was young and he wished he didn't yeah. do stuff like that you know he's like because i could have my career could have been over yeah then. well for sure yeah yeah so he regretted that i'm sure but it's funny that we're discussing peter pan and that kind of idea then and cory falman very much fits the peter pan he's very much this kid who, who mm. even as you see him now is like a 40 something year old man <sighs> he just seems like a little boy still to me who still wants to be michael jackson yeah yeah yeah. which again michael jackson is, is that's a whole peter pan thing again it's just yeah. it's very strange that that they I don't know how the connection of yeah, it between all of that. Yeah, Corey Feldman grew up with Michael Jackson. Um, yeah, doing his moves and you know I think he meeting him too. Like yeah, many it seemed like times. a big thing. Yeah, because I think hung they, out with him. Yeah, when became he became his friends with when them. he was doing Goonies and stuff. Yeah. yeah, so it's just um it's weird, and then he just wants to carry that on to be imitating him, which you know, and he does have that Peter Pan feel to him. I don't think that they've ever grown up. Yeah, completely. Yeah, but I think that's because, you know, I don't know. I can't remember exactly what his back story was, but I, didn't he he tried to get emancipated from his parents at one time, I think, didn't he? Yeah. Um so it's something like that. Like he he grew up basically on his own after a certain while, I think. Yeah, which is probably you know, like why him and Corey ended up pretty much both the way they did, which mm. is kind of sad really. Yeah, know. because he came from I think a single mom home his dad wasn't around Corey? yeah yeah that's right so yeah he was uh pretty sad how that worked out with them i think yeah no i do i do too um like i said beyond all the jokes and laughter of this movie mm. there's kind of like a sad side behind the scenes to this yeah mm-hmm. to, to a major degree i'm um, just to bring it back onto a lighter <laughs> back onto a lighter note um in the movie obviously like i said the boys are kind of established the characters by this act and then star comes into it takes the eye of the older brother he then pursues her and in pursuing her and trying to impress her he joins the gang of vampires the lost boys of the title mm-hmm. led by Kiefer Sutherland who live in a cave if I remember underneath um, the kind of the amusement park was yeah, it was it yeah it was, it was kind Santa of off a cliff isn't it it's off a rock yeah, yeah Santa Carla in, in, California, Carla. Yeah, in, in California yeah, yeah. 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 which apparently there's a line in the movie saying it's the murder capital 
of the world or something. But apparently that, that was the rumour that was that was, that was a bit true. Really? That they had yeah, apparently they had a lot of unsolved cases and stuff. Yeah. Actually I love true how, life things. Yeah, I love how it started off with the whole amusement park theme. Yeah. You know, on and the beach. The, yeah, and the actual amusement the, the the place where the film was shot then, that exact location is is reused um recently in Jordan Peele's Us. Us. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say kind that. kind of of interest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's a great setting for this movie because then you've got the, the comic book store and it, it, it's just so pop cultural, isn't it? Like comics, movies, mm-hmm. music because the, the reference again, the, the, the vampires of this movie that are kind of live in this cave with this great big Jim Morrison poster in the background which as a, you know, is a reference point to the use of their song People Are, People Are Strange. Yeah. Re-recorded for this by Echo and the Bunny Echo Man. Echo and the Bunny Man um, produced by Ray Manzarek of the doors so they keep, just to keep the connection going which it has become the kind of theme for this movie and that brings us to talk to about the soundtrack actually um, which, <laughs> which which your son do. loves more uh, he loves Echo's version better than the yeah. doors version well, I know that was <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what are you teaching him now <laughs> we're teaching lots of good things but yeah my once again Gene um, my lovely little eight year old boy it tells me that Echo and the Bunny Men's version is better than the Doors he didn't know there was a Doors version he's no. like what who's that and then is, you're like yeah, but I, I it's one of your favourite bands I know I have played it before as well I just I swear to god he's, he's, he doesn't want to know um, <laughs> he only knows Robert Palmer yeah well Gene if you're listening the Doors are better um, <laughs> I don't I like Echo but yeah, I do no, love I, the Doors yeah, I love Echo yeah. as a group too but mm, yeah and that song it's still the Doors um <laughs> And of course, as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, in excess with uh, Jimmy Barnes doing good times, which kind of fits because you know, it almost like, it's almost like yes, there's a Doors poster in the cave. Mm-hmm. There's a reference to how oh, cool Jim Morrison was and stuff, and it's almost like Jason Patrick is riffing on Michael Etchins and Jim Morrison with his look yeah. in this movie as well. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, in the mid eighties, Michael Etchins oh, was yeah. the guy to look you get like. Get the long hair. But what we really know is that Michael Etchins is a poor man's Jim Morrison. Um, oh God. <laughs> Who's seeing uh, Cry Little Sister again? Yeah. I love that song. Yeah. Um, I, I was just about to do it, but I'll, I'll spare you. you. No, I wanted to hear it. No, Ugh. I ain't doing it now. Chuck it in I got, later. I got shy. Okay. Really? <laughs> um, okay. If you would have heard me earlier, I was not shy. Okay. Singing my uh, She's in Parties. <laughs> yeah. The, the worst Bear House cover ever. Um, cry, cry Little Sister. Yes, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. Which, is, it, which was like, it's kind of considered the theme of this movie. Now, that's the main song that people say, The, the Lost Boys, is, is quite a little system. It was, written, it was written for this movie, too. Okay. Um, it was, and the, I'm trying to think of the guy who, who did it now. I but love it, it. But apparently, he was given he was given the story of The Lost Boys, mm-hmm. and then he went away and wrote the song to fit it. And that, so that was written for the movie. And it was covered recently by Marilyn Manson. Oh, God, I don't care about that. <laughs> Why are you telling I, me? I don't care. Because that's, that's the reason I told you. It's I, such a good song. I don't even want yeah, to hear it. I don't care. Is, did, he, did he ever write any of his own songs? Probably not. No. And he, then, he does covers left and right. Yeah, from the 80s. Um, yeah. And the only reason I wanted to mention that is because I knew you would do that, and I, I set you up that deliberately. <laughs> so I thought, how can I hurt Marilyn Manson? I'll let Hope loose on him. And you did well. It's horrible. Okay. A lot of people. <laughs> um, and then we have... Um, Beauty has her way as well. Okay. Do you remember that one? Um, Lost in the shadows when they're on the motorbikes. Ripping yeah. Down to the beach. Yeah. yeah. A little bit happy. Yeah. Um, and it's a good soundtrack. Yes, is it? Yeah. <laughs> but the the main one that we got to talk about though is, is the sax. Is I still believe by Tim Capello. Yeah, <laughs> the sexy sax man. <laughs> he shakes it too, doesn't he? <laughs> he's so pumped up in that movie. Oh, he's pumped and shaking. And yeah. That. Sweaty. I just love the fact now that if me and my friends, Stuart Stevenson, is probably listening to this, and and, and many others, Andy McCall, there's a whole host of my friends. If we and uh, Paul Worsfold as well, if we, Perry, if we if we ever talk about this movie, <laughs> yeah, man, who goes by two names, but if we ever talk about this movie, you will instantly talk about that straight away. I wish the, the barbarian would guy yeah. with all the chains and stuff. And apparently, should be your next yeah. Halloween costume. I don't think I could ever pull that. <laughs> Not unless you buy me a whole load of steroids for Christmas. Did, um, did any of your friends dress up like him? No. no. Did anyone ever look like that? <laughs> it's, yes. It's so, yeah. But apparently, he, um, Tim Capella then, who actually is there performing his own song in this movie, was mm. um, part of Tina Turner's back in band during the 80s. So must add to, you know, long in the industry. And apparently, um, between, um, sh- obviously there's a lot of downtime on a film set. Mm. And between certain scenes and stuff, he was constantly doing push-ups and chin-ups and stuff. Just constantly pumped up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it shows Jesus you um, have to pump I just, you up I just I got images of baby oil going everywhere <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. shaking his ass yeah you're uh, shaking just that girls covered in, in his baby oil um <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a minute. What are you thinking about? The girls and baby oil? No, I've just, or... I've got images of him shaking it on her. Just like him kind of, you know. What, is it, what does it come 
think it, oh you mean gonna, him sweating yeah <laughs> keep up oh jesus um you mean he's flinging off sweat yeah uh, baby, baby oil, oil sweat yeah yeah <laughs> covering girls and his, his juices um are you sure that really wasn't his sweat <laughs> He was constantly Jesus, pumping. Him. Oh, Jesus. No, honestly. That he was, but anyway, Tim Capello as the instantly recognisable sexy sax man. Did, sax man. Didn't you show me... Sex or sex. Didn't you show me a music video recently? Yes. I'm trying to think of the name of the group. Oh, Hope. I know. I'm terrible. It's oh, well, a, Hope goes into a little land of... Gunship. Gunship. They do amazing videos. And this um, is an animated video, And this it? is an animated video. Yeah, I did show it yeah, to you. And they did a homage Lost to Lost Boys and like an animated version of it's it. It's very but good. But I think towards the end, they do bring the real guy in at the end. Tim Capello. Yes. Oh, cool. He is in at the end of that video. So make sure... I can't remember the name of the video, but the, all their videos are good. They do... Um, riffs on like horror movies and yeah stuff. i remember you showed me like a vhs one didn't they yeah did well, like claymation they did yeah, like yeah, a claymation yes. video with like you very know good. jason pinhead all that texas cha- leather face so um gunship gunship so that, there's the shit out. yeah good band excellent music and great definitely videos great videos, videos. so yeah. definitely look for the lost boys one it's yeah really good yeah so tim capello even gets home yeah he does video. in the end i believe he shows up in it he does <laughs> okay and then this this uh, eventually from that scene then there's there's the lost in the shadows boy chase across the beach which is, is so 80s and then they take michael back get him to drink mm-hmm. what he thinks is wine obviously it's blood and then he becomes the vampire and then of course they they, they trick him and play games with him which is where we get the rice and the noodle scene you mm-hmm. know Read, yeah. You're reading back, it's Michael. All that business, yeah, which is fantastic. <laughs> just done past it. <laughs> what do you mean they're worms? Um, which, again, me and my mates piss ourselves laughing by quoting. Yeah. And then, of course, he then becomes the vampire. And then Corey Farman, uh, Corey Amy, who's, who's obviously his, his little brother, Sam, becomes aware of this. And then between... He, he, then he obviously wants to save his brother. So with the help of the Frog Brothers um, from the comic book store, with their comic book knowledge of, of vampires. <laughs> How to kill a vampire <laughs> yeah, well, with garlic it. and a cross yeah. and holy water. You better get yourself a garlic t-shirt, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Plenty of Corey Farman terrible impressions. Um, so <laughs> was that? Was it? I thought you were doing Jack Nicholson for a minute. You bet your ass. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, They're a little similar. Are they? Yeah. You need to work on that Corey oh, one. That was good. I thought these guys, you know, that whole bit is all when they kind of work, because basically they're kind of told, you know, if we can find out where they sleep, we can kill them while they sleep. So they find their cave and then they, and then they go out there with the frog brothers. Yeah. yeah, once they finally, yeah, once they finally got a deal with it, they don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. And the, 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 there's the, the scene where mates, you know, the whole burn rubber thing when they get out in the car after. Um, but as they're walking around the cave, you know, Corey Ames kind of like whimpering and moaning. He's like, oh, I thought these guys are supposed to live in coffins. And then Corey Feldman does the whole. They're hanging like bats. That's what this old place is what giant coffin <laughs> um yeah is it getting better yeah oh thank I you guess. oh thank you I, I, no because i didn't know you were doing it again <laughs> oh jesus anyway um so that was my cory Nich- cory nicholson. nicholson yeah um my christian slater's not too bad either no no um both the same are they yeah, but aren't they the same? I isn't don't know, tell Nichols- me. Isn't- are they the same or are they not the same? Isn't Christian Slater just a poor man's Jack Nicholson? Though? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Give me a line. Give me a line. Or- I really can't. <laughs> it's too early in the day for my cuffs. We'll come back for it's it. It's too, too early for cuffs. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah. So, and then by going to the cave to kill the head vampire, which they, because they've already, now oh, we come back to that actually, they go to the cave um, after a night of thinking it's maybe Max, who the mum is now dating, and they have that famous dinner party scene where they invite him over and mm-hmm. pull out all the tricks on him in there. Yeah, to try and trick him. Yeah, which is, once again, me and my mates will cry laughing at that scene, mm-hmm. just for the bit where the dog gets up on the table, and it's like, oh, someone's got bad breath, and it's like Nanook in it, like, stood over him. It's yeah. like, did anyone notice, not, did anyone not notice the dog get up on the, t- <laughs> on the table? It's great big fucking, was he a husky or something? Yeah. Um, someone's got bad breath. Hmm. Oh, it's garlic. You know. I bet you hate garlic, don't you? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's getting better. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, that scene is just fantastically funny to me. And mm-hmm. it still remains funny. We've seen it. I went to a screening of it a couple of years back, The Lost Boys. And it is one of their films. Um, it's funny because it's not one of my favourite films, but it is a film I've probably seen about a hundred times. I could probably quote every line in it just because every time it's on I end up watching it and it's like I think it's a 95 minute movie and it just it just flows quote really after quote so quickly mm-hmm. and uh, we forgot about the frog song what frog song the frog song 
the the uh what's the old song that he sings when he's in the bathtub oh that yeah ain't got a home ain't got a home that one yeah i love that song i'm a lonely boy yeah yeah lonely, and he's a lonely frog yeah in- <laughs> Corey aim in the bath isn't yeah. it yeah <laughs> Um, when when the nook comes in and, and saves him, yeah, by biting his brother. Oh, the nook. Yeah, yeah, he bites his brother, didn't he? Yeah, he does. Well, he deserved it. Does, it. What did you do, my dog? You asshole. <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, we'll be quoting this all day now. Um, <laughs> just my brother is one shit sucking vampire. You wait to tell mum about this. Um, yeah. <laughs> so okay, we work out that it's not Max, and then of course they 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 go to the cave and slay the first vampire to get their hands on which unfortunately is poor alex winter who i should mention is in this movie is marco yeah. um, obviously more famous for bill, B- and ted. bill and ted absolutely um and he gets staked hanging upside down and, and, and you know he gets a, a good little death scene to make up for the fact he's hardly in the movie <laughs> um but you know but you know it's him and they kill him and obviously that it makes no difference because they've got the wrong one because obviously what do they really need who, at this point in the movie they think they need to kill his keeper Sutherland. Um, and there's the scene where they escape from the cave and, and Kiefer reaches out and I've got to mention this actually it's a bit of trivia but Kiefer reaches out to I think Corey Ames' ankle and it, 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 he draws his ankle into the light and it burns Kiefer Sutherland's eyes obviously because he's exposed to sunlight his mm-hmm. vampires cannot be exposed to sunlight and then he kind of leans back and there's the, 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 I don't know if you remember the scene but like a tear runs from his eye do you remember? No. And apparently the, the tear was real because mm. they were wearing contact lenses that were so harsh oh, on the eyes. Yeah. Um, there was just a close-up scene they were doing. Oh, yeah, I do remember that now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it looks impressive in the movie. When he has the yellow contacts in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it looks impressive when you see it on, on screen. And apparently, though, George Schumacher was doing a close-up of, of Kiefer Sutherland. Uh, not, I'm not even sure if it was for that scene. Yeah. And he caught this tear running in his eye, and it, he put it in mm. there. Um, and Kiefer Sutherland said it was just sheer where his eyes were that dry. From oh these, yeah. These contact lenses. Oh, they hurt. Like, because I wear contacts. So yeah. I know if they're in something gets in it or they're just irritating, they yeah. will make your eyes water. Yeah. So, and kill. Yeah, so, so mm-hmm. yeah, a real tear of uh, pain for Kiefer Sutherland. I feel you, Kiefer. I feel you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, I mean, like I said, we, I mean, we're doing all the funny scenes now. And then, of course, that sets up a final showdown then because they've obviously upset the vampires. The vampires don't like the kids. The kids want the vampires. And then we've got this big showdown at the house at the end where they know they're going to come from because at this point they've taken Star and Star has now fallen in love for the oldest brother and so therefore to help bring the older river back to, to normal along with Star they're going to have to you know kill the Ed vampire which I've already said but then, but this it leads basically to this big showdown at the house at the end which is a fantastically shot sequence full of like you said the death by stereo loads of silly lines and, and stuff that, that really work for it but the scene uh, I want to mention actually which is probably the one that scared my cousin <laughs> the one that scared my cousin because up to a certain point we, we were not which seeing which cousin it. was that? I still can't mention any names <laughs> um, because at a certain point in the movie we don't see him with the fangs and the con- like you said the contact lenses they're mm-hmm. just the, the, you know they're kind of hanging around the cave yeah, and that kind of thing. So we don't really see the scene when they finally turn and they take Michael up there and they're mm-hmm. like, okay, now you know what we are and mm-hmm. now you know what you are. You know, you can never grow old, which was a line taken from the original script mm-hmm. when it was the Peter Pan thing. Yeah. You can never grow old, you can never die, but you must feed Michael. And yeah. it's like, this is what you are now. And they yeah. kind of finally show themselves and that scene where it just becomes incredibly, it's like a beach scene in it where they pick on like a load of party young kids partying on the beach do you remember when they sort of feast on them yeah. and Michael sees them all getting killed and it's quite a graphic it's like a massacre yeah mm-hmm. and it's quite a graphic scene that like almost like comes out of nowhere because up to this point you you do feel that teeny vampire goon is idea that was originally there and mm-hmm. all of a sudden you've got this you know four blooded scene on the beach where yeah. like you said they massacred the party goers and Michael sees this and he's like oh shit you know you guys yeah, I can't do you that. guys are the real deal he has a conscience mm-hmm. yeah and apparently Kiefer Sutherland um, said that when they were shooting that scene it was more violent the original scene that they shot they had to like trim it down mm. so it was like a full on sequence to do of just them slaughtering these party goers yeah um, but apparently yeah I mean I'm not sure about deleted scenes and all the rest of it but apparently there's the, the, it was a lot worse than what you see in the final movie because I think it's I think for that for that particular movie it's quite a shocking sequence mm-hmm and uh, and a good, but a good one though because they're all kind of you know dancing around the beach to walk this way and they if I remember correctly and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then the next minute they're, 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 you know, the one guy asks can you bite him in the head or pull pull the top of his head off it's just real full on I can't remember it's yeah no it's great it's a great down. great piece I had to mention that scene actually and then of course as I said there's the final show down at the ace where they do take out each of the vampires who, who were played obviously by Keith Severin who I've mentioned already Alex Winter from Bill and Ted who's the first one to die and is not at this house show then there's also Billy Worth uh, another actor who, who was in Abel Farrer's um, Body Snatchers remake and and the other guy was the skater guy who's dead in real life unfortunately you know totally forget his name which is really bad of me <laughs> 
It's very I hate funny. myself when I do that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, he was in Thrashing, the, the skateboard movie yeah. with, with Brolin. Um, mm-hmm. The blonde. Josh Brolin. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wanted to mention him because he, he died recently, sadly. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so when they have this final showdown, they're all kind of taking, they all have their own kind of individual death sequences. You know, the ones kind of put in the bath with the garlic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the holy water obviously because um, they've loaded up the, the, the water pistols which is a funny little touch the water pistols are full of um, holy water because mm-hmm. obviously they're kids um, fighting the vampires which, yeah. is, which is kind of referenced in Night of the Demons too isn't it yeah. but they got the oozes mm-hmm. the little oozy things with the water pistol things yeah. with the holy water um, so yeah and then there's the death by stereo where he's kind of impaled with an arrow mm-hmm. into the stereo and then there's the final showdown between Michael and David who go head to head it's almost like Jim Morrison versus Billy Idol <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, they throw each other around the basement a bit and he ends up as I said on the deer antlers but he was kind of with the idea that he may come back for the sequel uh, and, okay. and that was kind of it but and then he doesn't he doesn't because apparently when she killed the head vampire you return back to normal and of course he doesn't yeah. and then we realise there is still one more out there and then it becomes unveiled that it was Max who is kind of the father figure yeah to the boys to the boys and he wanted to recruit mm-hmm. Diane Weist um, David um, Michael and Sam obviously for, for to make up the Lost Boys and then Diane Weiss realises that she's been duped all movie and then the Grandpa t- <laughs> it was a minor character in the background adding some real funny he's lines he's like the crazy there, um, Doc, uh, Christopher Lloyd character in Back to Doc. the Future Doc yeah he's, he's kind like of walking crazy around Doc. Yeah. Yeah. and he turns up at the yeah, he drives I love the fact that he just drives through his own house he, just, <laughs> he smashes it you know? and he's got these great big wooden stakes up on his track that he's, he's kind of devised for himself and the stakes fly off and finally we kill Max mm. and then everything is, is put back to normal and that's how the, how the movie ends we should mention Grandpa actually because he has some funny bits in it yeah, he? he does. And uh, he takes because obviously they, they turn up at the East Coast and live with Granddad, and Granddad sounds like a boring guy because obviously he hasn't got a TV or anything. And these mm. are young kids, and they're like, oh, you know, you know, you don't need a TV when you got a TV guide. Mm. And uh, the whole bit with Corey Ames, like, oh, I could drive this into town, and he sits in the car and like, kind of starts it up and turns it back off. And he's like, yeah, that's as close to town as I like to go. <laughs> <laughs> which is <laughs> which is yeah. great. And, yeah, great humor. Uh, yeah, that no, there's some really funny stuff, and it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I said, it's very. It's, I mean, it's very 1980s. It's very teenage. It's very pop culture. But there is some funny stuff, isn't there? It's like, mm. you know, what's with all the attitude, Michael? Too much dynasty. Yeah. <laughs> You know, great, great it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it picks off the um, pop culture of oh, completely because Tex Chase Massey gets a reference at the beginning of the yeah. when they first go to Grandpa's like basement bit of the house, they're like, shit, you know, talk about Texas Chase Massey. Mm. So there's a lot of little uh, nods, you know, not only in the story and, and the script and jokes, but also as we mentioned with the music, um, which is is very good here. Mm. Um, so yeah, and then we have this the final line where Grandad restores peace by killing Max and then goes to the fridge pours out herself a drink because always been in trouble with Santa Carla there are too many goddamn vampires and then they it's kind of it's a creepy last shot actually because he's kind of silhouetted by the fridge isn't he and it's, and it's almost like implying <laughs> that maybe he's a vampire which is yeah. this weird um, final shot of the movie as, as, ever, as peace is restored and, mm. and Star is obviously he was only ever a half vampire yeah and the little kid Laddie yeah. is it the um, little boy yeah mm-hmm. um, is also obviously because he's a a half vampire as well. There were a lot of people kind of think that he's related to Star in this movie. Or something. Yeah. He wasn't. He's just another kid they picked up to keep yeah. Star coming. She just kept him, yeah, yeah, protecting him uh, from maternal kind of thing. But yeah, mm-hmm. like they she's a vampire, um, which is like I said, that, that element of the story is not really explored, and, and it's not also in um, in Near Dark. And I want to mention that really because I was Lost Boys in Near Dark is so similar. Mm-hmm. Um, both released the same year, both deal with an innocent taken into a family of vampires and have mm. to kind of adapt to the lifestyle. And they're kind of both seduced into it by the pretty young girl then, um, mm. Jamie Gertz, obviously Jenny Wright in that one. And then there's the little boy laddie in that one. Um, more impressively, Joshua Miller as Homer in Near Dark. Which, like I said, in terms of... <sighs> In terms of a movie, is it for me personally? Near Dark is a better movie, but Lost Boys is so much fun, and I, I, I yeah, can't help but same like it. And quote it kind of, but yeah, both pretty, different. Yeah. One's super dark, and one's yeah. just fun and light. Cheesy. Yeah, the tones, mm-hmm. are, the tones of the movies are completely different. Even though yeah. the massacre on the beach happened, it's still <laughs> light and fun and cheesy. Yeah, no, but that's why I mentioned it because it, it's a scene that comes out of nowhere, um, and always catches people off guard, and obviously left my cousin at the bottom of my aunt's bed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He'll never live it down. No, was, no. <laughs> No naming and shaming. Not unless somebody stamps up a good deal of money and I might spill my guts. Um, so yeah, The Lost Boys comes out in 87. It's an instant hit. People want a sequel. Joel Schumacher was quite keen to do one, like as I mentioned before, called The Lost Girls, which never came to nothing. There was two comic books released. Mm-hmm. A TV series. Um, obviously, it's always been an idea. And it seems like we're getting closer to that now, apparently. 
which is of interest to me because I'm not really sure what you're going to do with it and who's going to be in it because there has been two spin-off movies to this, hasn't there? Oh, it's crap. Did which, you see The Lost no, Boys? No, I have to be honest, I haven't. Okay, no. shit. Is it The Tribe, one of them? Yeah. And then, yeah. And, I don't know. I, mean, I don't think I've seen both of them, but okay. I've seen one of them. Okay. And it was terrible. And Corey Feldman's... And the, yeah, did both of them come back, I think, the Frog Brothers, or was it just Corey Feldman? Definitely Corey Feldman. I'm not sure about Jameson. I'm not really sure. If I can't did, remember if he, he was in it, too. I but thought Cor- he was. But Corey Feldman is, isn't he? Yeah. And so, so I hear, because I haven't seen it, mm-hmm. um, that Kiefer Sutherland's brother is in it, apparently. Okay. Yeah. Not that I could tell you what, what he even looked like, to be honest. Yeah, um, so I didn't I know, know Donald, he had a brother. Yeah, Donald Sutherland had quite a few kids. Because um, Kiefer Sutherland's one of a twin. He has a twin sister. Oh, really? Rachel, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I mean, that's why I'd never seen those two movies. I knew they wouldn't be worth my time. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? No, it's not. I had to, because I had to see what it was about. But yeah, because I, Cor- I, I mean, the late Corey Aim, we should add, you know, sadly gone now. But he, he was arraigned when they made the first one. But He, he was angry. But he, he wasn't asked, was he? Yeah, no, he got really upset about it. Because they actually did a TV show of called The, the Corys. Um, the Two Corys. The Two Corys. And it was really good. And it was around that time was when this a, they were was casting Was this a Lifetime it. movie? <laughs> a Lifetime TV show? It was actually like a TV show. I think it was on any movie. I can't remember. Yeah. No, it wasn't a Lifetime, but they did come out with a Lifetime movie reenactment movie. Oh, okay. But no, Sorry. this was actually the two actors like doing was you it know, like a, a reality on the wall TV. Thing, like yeah. the mm-hmm. It was reality TV. Okay. Yeah. So it was just showing them hanging out. I think he moved in. It was like for TV. He moved in with him, him and his uh, wife at the time, Corey Feldman's wife. And um, so yeah, it was like the three of them living together. And he was like really upset that Corey Feldman got yeah. asked and he didn't. Do you know? And why? I think that you know was kind of like the. Do you know why it was? I can't remember why. I think because he was st- he was on drugs, okay. and um, so that was kind of even took him more in the downfall. And then he sadly passed away not too long after that. But I think Corey Feldman said that was a big part too of why, was, uh, yeah, why he just felt deeper into it, yeah. I mean, you know, he was taking drugs, and then I think he died of like a heart heart failure. Yeah, from and from pres- prescribed prescription drugs, drugs yeah. which is killer. Sadly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean... So, yeah, it's um, it was said that he didn't get asked into the movie. I think I probably would have enjoyed it, seeing those two back on film. But one on last, one last mm-hmm. time, yeah. Yeah, but that didn't happen. Okay, I mean... So, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see the other one, though, just to see how bad that, is. <laughs> that turns maybe, out. Maybe that's what we should do later, try and find those sequels just to yeah. see how bad. I could just... I mean, I know I had, like, a mate who I used to work with, and he said it was terrible. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of knew it would be. Mm-hmm. I really did. Yeah. Um, but like I said, you know, the film got released in 87, made a lot of money. It did all right with the critics. I think Roger Ebert even gave it two and a half out of four stars, which is, mm-hmm. for Roger Ebert, a horror movie, Jesus, that guy doesn't like anything, does he? And so no. even he gave it a decent review. <laughs> even he gave it a decent review. Boom, um, Roger Ebert. Yeah, two, two thumbs down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> two thumbs down. Two thumbs down. <laughs> Don't like him. No. So, like I said, yeah, basically, it's a well thought of fun, very 1980s movie that as a cult following, it just gets bigger by the year. Mm. Is there anything I can say? Yeah, um, I know. Like, it just kids, every generation loves Take it. to it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is great. You know, which is, that's the, you the want that long, longevity a of a mm-hmm. movie, yeah. I mean, uh, the only other films I can really think of, like Grease and things like that, they just keep going. Yeah. You know, you never get to it. You never gets to a generation um, where they go, "Oh God, it seems so dated now, doesn't it?" You know, because Greece just kept rolling. You know, mm-hmm. Greece was obviously big when it was released in seventy eight. My sisters grew up with it, and then I've got friends who've got kids. Mm-hmm. Like you know, uh, one of my friend's daughter like loves it. It just keeps going, and I think Lost Boys feels the same way because you see a lot. I've seen a lot of young kids now. Mm-hmm. Um, I seen one in the supermarket going back a couple of years back, and she was only young, probably about fourteen, fifteen. She had a Lost Boys t shirt on, <laughs> so it just keeps going. Mm-hmm. And the cult of this movie, yeah. Um, which great. is great. And I think thing is, um, I think like Stranger Things and that whole eighties nostalgia thing has kind of probably helped mm-hmm. um, give these films I wouldn't say a second life because I don't think it needed a second life, but have kept them living and going then if you know what I mean. Yeah. I um, think so. Yeah. So there you are that. The Lost Boys. The Lost Boys. Um the nineteen eighty seven cult favourite that just keeps go in um just before we do finish Mm -hmm. though after it's been a fun discussion of this one is there anything you want to add or say oh yeah you can join us on facebook at sound and vision join us on instagram and yeah we're fun we're a fun group come join us yeah (laughs) i sound like a be one of us michael (laughs) join us join us michael (laughs) 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 yeah i'm a lost boy Really? Deep Ju- down. Yeah. Just repeat. It's only a podcast. It's only a podcast. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, yeah please do mm-hmm. yeah and thanks for listening and yeah, tuning in absolutely mm-hmm. the more the merrier as well like more people to get involved in it it's the better it's just it's just like I said, it's so much fun when you've got a bigger audience and the in-jokes get funnier as well. Yeah, think. yeah, definitely. Okay, so, um, with everything said and done here, I guess, this is it for episode 17. Please join us for episode 18. we got a special treat for episode 20. What, what, what is that? Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> we'll have, maybe you'll have to tune in and find out yourself as we're recording it. Um, I don't so, remember anything. No. Is that the rant show? Are we doing Ooh, the ranch show? Could be. Hint, hint. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so. That would be the goofy show. The goof. We might come out different on yeah, that one, poss- aren't we? Yeah, you might. <laughs> It might be like the revelation scene in, in Lost Boys on the beach. <laughs> Hope I'll rip the top of my head open and, yeah. and drink my blood. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. I yeah. look forward to it, even though I don't really know what it's about. <laughs> You're looking forward to drinking my blood? No, the show. Oh, okay. Goof. All right. <laughs> Well, I'll leave it there before it gets any more crazy. <laughs> and this just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. If you haven't seen The Lost Boys, go and watch it. And until we meet again, this is Ian James, as always, saying goodbye. And this is Hope saying goodbye. Goodbye. You'll never grow old, Michael. And you'll never die. But you must feed.